Audrey and I have had a lot of conversations about her sharing over the last few years, um, and I found it fitting that she would agree to do so this year, especially with the theme of our conference. Proverbs 31:25 says she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Audrey is a genuine example of a woman clothed in strength and dignity, and that smile on her face is further proof of that. I asked her a few weeks ago to pick anybody that she wanted to introduce her, and so when she chose me, I was honored and humbled to my core. She reminded me of something that I said to her on May 28, 2017, at about 5.46 in the evening. She shared with me the impact that this message had on her, uh, which I didn't even know about until last week, and she asked me to share it with you. Hey there, I was watching you today at church. You seriously amaze me. When I see you, I look at you and wonder how you got out of bed that morning, how you put your makeup on and fixed your hair, how you eat, drink, and breathe, how you stand in church and sing, the Lord gives and takes away, how you laugh at something funny the pastor says about parenting. I literally asked the Lord this morning, how is she doing this? His answer was so clear. Grace, Rebecca, that's my grace. You are a true testament of the grace and mercy of God. You are truly an inspiration to me. You're doing this with so much dignity and beauty. God is so merciful, and I've seen the scriptures come alive in your life. My words don't even do it justice. I'm not going to share the last couple of sentences with you because I want Audrey to share that with you. But, you know, these words are just as true today as they were in 2017. And I think many of you that know Audrey would be in full agreement with that. So with that being said, would you join me in welcoming to the stage Audrey McCleary. Will y'all join us in prayer? We're going to pray with her before she speaks. Oh, Father God, we just all come before you now, Lord. And God, we just thank you so much, Father, for the honor of walking alongside this woman and doing life with her, Father. God, I just um, thank you so much, God, that... Um, uh, she is a woman of virtue. Lord, thank you for her example in our lives that, that we don't even get deserved. We do not deserve to even get to watch. Father, thank you for that, Lord. God, thank you that you're going to anoint every single word that comes out of her mouth, God. Thank you so much, God, that you have placed specific women in this room tonight, God, to hear these words that come out of her mouth, Father. God, she was created for such a time as this. And so, God, I just thank you that there is going to come healing in her life and in other people's lives. And that walls will come down and barriers will be broken through this special testimony. Father, thank you for the boldness and the bravery that you've given Audrey to even prepare this testimony. So, Father, I just uh, lift her up to you now before your throne, and thank you, God, for her. And I pray you would anoint every single word, and it would pierce these women's hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very glad to be here. Um, like Rebecca said, we've talked in the past that one day I would tell my story. There will be lots of crying. I'm <laughs> warning you in advance, but... Um, and I'm okay with that. So um, I also have it all written because there's no way I could just stand up here and, and speak it. So I will mostly be reading my testimony to you. Um, I'm not a public speaker. I have, that will soon be evident, but I've never uh, <laughs> talked in front of a group in my entire life. And so 
not only am I talking in a group for the first time, but I'm telling this story to a group for the first time. You're beautiful doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So um, um, when we talked about doing this, I said, I've always admired those who are able to lead prayers and speak eloquently and, and say beautiful things. When I was asked to speak about my story, I said, I'm not a perfect Christian. I don't have all the pretty words. I don't know all the verses to say. I don't have the beautiful prayers. Like Kelly, I always admire her prayers. They're beautiful. And um, they said, that's okay. You don't have to know everything about the Bible. You don't have to have beautiful prayers. You just have to tell your story. And people will see how the Lord has worked in your life. So I finally agreed to tell my story and all its tragedy and ugliness and how the Lord has worked in my life to bring beauty from ashes. I also want to say that some of these words at times might not be my own. I will have copied something into a journal that I liked that I read and, and going back and looking through my journals, there's things written in there that I don't even remember where I saw them. So I've tried to quote who I am, um, quote who I'm quoting, quote who I'm <laughs> saying words from, um, but it, it may not always be totally 100% accurate. So, all right. Thank you all for watching online, which is so amazing. I know I have people back in Bryan College Station, where we're originally from, um, a friend in Georgia, Missouri. I have my girlfriends from College Station that came and surprised me, and from Bryan back there. So, and I felt your prayers today. I know there's been so many people praying for me, and I have felt it. I have felt the love. I'm not even shaking right now, and I, <laughs> which is amazing because I've been shaking all day thinking about it, but, but I'm doing all right. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I want to talk about our identities. We all have them. Wives, mothers, girlfriends, teachers, doctors. Mine has been a registered nurse since I was 25. More specifically, an ER nurse, which I've always been very proud of. Um, a short story to tell you how that career path came about. My husband Kevin and I were pregnant with our second child. Long story short, she had a genetic condition and we lost her and had to give birth to her at 20 weeks. In the hospital, I had two different nurses. The first nurse was harsh and brusque. She didn't explain things to me. She was very short with us. She hooked me up to the belts. I knew from giving birth to my daughter, Madison, that one monitored contractions and the other monitored the baby's heartbeat. I didn't understand why she was putting that on me. Didn't she know my daughter didn't have a heartbeat? I finally asked why she was putting them on me if my child was not alive, and she replied that it was to monitor my contractions. No other comment, not an I'm so sorry you lost your child, nothing. The next nurse, though, she was amazing. She uh, talked to us, learned, learned that we wanted to see and hold our daughter and do anything it took to be able to do that. So um, after 24 hours of labor, I gave birth to our daughter, Grace Ann. She cleaned her up, put her in a hat, and swaddled her in a blanket, and she prayed over us. This nurse did, gave us such comfort. And I thought, I wanna be able to provide comfort like that for someone. I wanna be able to impact someone's life like that. So when the company I worked for went bankrupt and laid off all the workers, I went to nursing school. Just one example of where the Lord's plan was not my plan, but led to something good. I knew from the beginning the area I wanted to work, and no, it was definitely not labor and delivery. I was too traumatized to go through that. Um, my favorite show used to be ER, which I guess the modern comparison would be Grey's Anatomy, but less soap opera E. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the trauma and excitement, and I'm also pretty nosy or curious. I'm also pretty curious about <laughs> things going on, and so I, when I would see ambulances or fire trucks going somewhere, I like to know what's going on, what's happening. So when you're an ER nurse, you get all the info. So, um, so that was it. The ER was the only place I ever wanted to work as a nurse. So I worked nights as a tech in the ER while I attended school and helped raise our daughter. Our families helped a lot. Thank you, moms, over here. Um, I graduated from nursing school and gave birth to our son, Tanner, two weeks later. 
If anyone here is a nurse, a police officer, or EMS, a firefighter, or married to one of these, the fear is always that the next emergency call you're out on or that comes into the ER is going to be someone you know, a friend, a family member. The first ER I worked at was in College Station, our hometown, with these three nurses right here. We worked together in the ER. Um, one time, let's see, and those fears were realized more than once. One time the ambulance brought us a patient that had been in a motorcycle wreck. He was unrecognizable. We were going through his things, trying to get a name, date of birth, phone number, things like that. And I saw his driver's license and realized I went to high school with him. That was one of many friends from school that I took care of in there. Um, one time I took care of my brother-in-law, who'd been gored by a hog. So that was exciting. And uh, another time they rolled my father-in-law in on a stretcher having a stroke. And he is okay now, but of course it was very scary. Um, I have a friend who was going to be here tonight, but I took care of her son, who had, was in a bad ATV wreck and came in with two broken legs. So growing up and, and being a nurse in the same town you grew up, you, you see that. So let's see. let's see. When we moved from College Station, I worked at a trauma center in San Antonio for a year and then got tired of the drive and got, started working in the ER at the hospital here in Jordanton. So fast forward four years, I'm now the ER director. I still love the ER, the trauma and the drama. I have the freedom to attend all my children's sporting events and important moments. My husband is enjoying his job and the increased amount of free time he's able to spend with us. Our family is happy. Our daughter Madison will graduate with honors from high school in a few months and has been accepted at Sam Houston with the goal of attending medical school. Our son Tanner is doing well in school and enjoying time hunting and playing sports. I feel like I have everything under control and life is good. One morning, I left before anyone else was awake to go to an ER staff meeting. We had just concluded the meeting when I received a call from my husband and these were his exact words and I will never forget them. The kids have been in an accident and won't wake up. I could hear the tremor and terror in his voice he told me where he was, and I made sure that 911 had been called. I quickly consult with my ER staff and physician. Do we set up the trauma room? Is EMS on the way? Do I go to the scene? Do I wait for them here? And they encouraged me to go to the scene. And so one of my night shift nurses drove me. I am an ER nurse, and I know how to be calm under pressure. On the way there, I called Air Life made sure that a helicopter was en route, and they said that the weather was preventing them at that moment, but that, would, but that they would be on their way soon. After that, I just prayed over and over, Lord, please let them be okay, please let them be okay, please let them be okay. I repeated it the entire drive there. I arrived on the scene just a mile from our house to see my daughter's car in the ditch with personnel trying to cut her out. There's one ambulance on the scene, so I go immediately to it and open the back doors. I see a paramedic friend performing CPR on my 11-year-old son. I cannot believe this is happening. Still in ER nurse mode, I think, those are not adequate chest compressions. They were, it was just, that was my ER nurse. I survey his injuries, which were horrific, and tell them to do everything they can. I go to check on Madison, and they have removed her from the car and are loading her into the second ambulance that's arrived on the scene. They're performing CPR on her as well. I know both medics that are taking care of her. I pray to God, Lord, please don't take both my children. Please let one of them live. Kevin is by my side at that moment. We go to check on Tanner. It's looking hopeless. We call our families. I have not cried. I think I'm in nurse mode, but more likely it was probably shock. The paramedics have spoken to my ER physician at the hospital for any other advice, and he has told them to call it. They have done everything possible for my son, and he is not going to make it. I go back to Madison's ambulance, and they tell me, Audrey, we're stopping CPR. She is gone. At that point, Air Life lands their helicopter in the field next to us. 
They get out and survey the scene. A few minutes later, they come to speak with us. I calmly thank them for coming and shake their hands. Kevin is beside me and does the same. I still have not cried. We call our families and I say the words out loud. Madison and Tanner are dead. Saying the words out loud make them real and then I can't stop crying. Now I know that most people have had a loss in their life, a grandparent, a parent, a friend, but child loss is different. It is out of the natural order of things. It's not supposed to happen that way. There's not even a word in the English, English language for, for that. I mean, we have widows, widow, widowers, orphans. The bond between a child and a parent is unlike any other. I read of a preacher saying that child loss is a unique type of loss. He said, in fact, the bond between a parent and child is so strong, that is why I believe God chose to use that relationship to demonstrate his love for us. When he gave up his own son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, he was showing the highest form of love. Wow. <laughs> I understood it in a way that I never had before. That is love. We were interviewed by our local paper a few days after the kid's accident. They asked, if it, asked us if we had any regrets. I paused to think about that, but Kevin answered immediately, not a single one. On the spot, in that moment, I said that I didn't either. We had fun together. We supported each other. They knew how much they were loved because we told them and we showed them. We ate dinner together as a family nightly. We took family vacations. We were together all the time. We knew how lucky we were. In fact, Kevin and I used to say that to each other. How do we get so lucky to have such amazing kids? We didn't take it for granted. Time after that is fuzzy for a while. After the funerals were over, which, if you don't know me, the funeral was right here. So my children's caskets were right here. And it was hard for a long time for me to come here. After the funerals were over and everyone had gotten back to their own lives, we didn't know what to do. What do you do when every plan for your life changes in a single instant? What do you do when your whole world falls apart? We had to get out of the house where we were surrounded by their things and their pictures and their memories. So we drove. We packed our bags, got in the Jeep, and just started driving. We didn't talk much, each of us in our own pain and misery. We drove through Texas, then New Mexico, up to Colorado, through Utah, Nevada, California, Arizona. We saw the wonders of God's creation, the mountains and valleys, the rivers and forests, the redwoods and Grand Canyon. At each beautiful stop, I was thinking it was just another place we didn't get to take our kids. But I also knew that what they were experiencing was so much more than anything we were seeing. We finally returned home after a few weeks. Give me just a second to get a drink. On our road trip, Kevin drove the entire time. I was too scared to drive. Our children had been on a two-lane country road with no divider and were hit by an oncoming truck. Even when I finally did start driving, I felt like every oncoming vehicle was drifting into my lane to hit me head on. If I'm honest, I still, say, I still stay as far to the right as possible and am hyper-conscious about on oncoming vehicles. So we're home. Now what? Our house is quiet. We're traumatized. We are broken. We think of all the dreams we had that are now impossible. We feel their empty seats at the dinner table and their cold spots on the couch. We close the doors to their rooms and don't go in there. The whole world continues to go on around us like nothing has happened. I wanted to wear a shirt that says, everything is not okay, my children are dead. I look in the mirror and I look exactly the same, even though everything about me had changed. You know, Madison's senior year, she wanted to get her nose pierced. And I told her that she could, but she had to wait till she graduated from high school. So I decided that would be my change, almost an act of defiance. I would have never gotten my nose pierced as a conservative mother and nurse. Now that I'm no longer a mother and wasn't currently working as a nurse and was a completely different person than I was two months ago, I did it. I got my nose pierced. 
in honor of my daughter who didn't get to get hers done. Though I'm pretty sure that if she was here and had hers pierced, she'd tell me that I'm being ridiculous and way too old to do that. <laughs> it's been almost four years now and I still have it. I probably always will. Be a grandma with a nose ring. Or grandma age with a nose ring. All the time of silence on the road and in the house gave me a lot to think about, which wasn't necessarily a good thing. I realized I did have a regret, a huge one, about my children. I was raised in the church, grew up in the church. I was baptized when I was 11 by my grandfather, who's hopefully able to watch this. I'm a Christian, but I got lazy. My kids knew about the Lord. We attended church, though not consistently. We allowed things, I allowed things, like softball tournaments, volleyball tournaments, baseball games, and hunting take the priority on our weekends, rather than going to church. My husband, Kevin, was not raised in the church and was not a, a Christian. It's always been my hope and desire that Kevin one day would become a Christian. I don't think that I was the best example of a Christian wife to lead him to the Lord. I feel a lot of guilt for that, and guilt that I didn't teach my children more about the Lord or encourage us as a family to spend more time at church. That is my biggest regret. And the Lord and I have spoken about that many times now, and I have asked for forgiveness and know that he has forgiven me, but sometimes it still creeps in, and I think, what if I didn't do enough? Think about that. You are responsible for your children's salvation. Now, I understand that once they're grown and leave the house, they make their own decisions, but how are they going to learn about the Lord if not from you? You always think you have more time. More time to teach your children about the Lord. More time for your husband to become a Christian. For the days, weeks, months that followed, we were adrift. I wanted to know why. Lord, why did my children die? Did we do something to cause this? Are we being punished? Was this part of your plan? Did God abandon us? You could have stopped it, Lord. Why didn't you stop it? We went for a few sessions with the counselor. He did not feel like that was what we needed. Our mindset was that talking about it with a stranger wasn't going to change the fact that they were gone. That was the reality, and no amount of talking would make it better. I know there are people who would strongly disagree, but I'm only telling you what worked for us. I attended a retreat with other grieving mothers three months later. I didn't think I would have compassion for anyone else there. I was bitter, and I thought, who else lost all their children? I was feeling sorry for myself. At the retreat, I was the newest member to the club that no one wants to be in. There were positive things about the retreat, and I did feel compassion for the other moms, too. But the other thing it did was scare me. There were mothers there who were five years out, 15 years out, and they said that the pain never gets better, that it's still just as painful as the day they died. That terrified me. I thought, how can I live like this? How can I get through hours, much less days and weeks and years without my children? Grief is an ugly thing. It is an actual physical pain where your chest is in a vice and you feel like you can't breathe. How can I survive this, Lord? I don't want to survive this. I felt hopeless. Everyone has heard the stages of grief. At one point, I looked it up, hoping to have some sort of roadmap for what I was feeling and if I'd ever be able to breathe again. The stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I've since learned that it doesn't always go in this order, and you don't finish one stage and move to the next. Grief is a roller coaster. I know this makes me odd, but I never felt anger. I was hurt, heartbroken, devastated. I was bereaved, I was confused, I was questioning, but I wasn't angry. Not that the emotion would be wrong, it just wasn't one of mine. God can handle angry. And it wasn't just the loss of my children that I was grieving. Of course, that was the worst part, but there are other aspects. I was grieving the loss of all the plans we had for our future. That would no longer be possible. I was grieving my loss as a senior mom and mother of the bride, mother of the groom, and grandmother. I was gr grieving the loss of control over my life. 
I was grieving the more carefree me that would never be that way again. Grief takes up enormous mental and emotional space and energy. One of the side effects of this is that those who are grieving forget things a lot. I learned that the fog of grief is a real thing. You literally feel as if you are walking around in a fog. Everything seems hazy and unclear. You lose your train of thought mid-sentence. You can't pay attention to anything for long. The ability to participate in small talk is non-existent. You easily lose focus on any task. You lose things, can't remember why you walked into a room. Your mind is constantly racing. I had so much trouble sleeping the first few years, and still do occasionally, because I couldn't shut my mind off at night. If I didn't go to sleep immediately, I would lay there and think about them and cry. So then I would go, go, go until I was exhausted enough that I could fall asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow and I didn't have to lay there and think. In addition to the grief, we had been through trauma. The accident was a mile from our house. We passed by it every day. Trauma changes everything. Here are some statements about trauma from Crisis and Trauma Counseling by Dr. H. Norman Wright. The emotional wounding of trauma assaults beliefs we have, we have about ourselves and about our lives. Our will to grow, our spirit, dignity, and sense of security. Trauma affects the way our brains process information. It overrides the brain's normal way of thinking, feeling, and experiencing its environment. Trauma causes the right and left sides of our brain to be disconnected so that our analytical side and our emotional side now operate separately versus at the same time. The left side does the analyzing and thinking, and the right side has the feelings and memories. That made so much sense to me, because I experienced that, and I still do. One day I was venting my frustration with myself to my friend Kelly. I literally cannot remember anything that involves feelings. Please forgive me if you're one of those people who've told me something personal or sad in your life and I've never asked you about it again or acted like I didn't know what you were talking about when you were talking about it. My brain blocks those things out. I can remember facts, things about business, but not emotional things. And right now, I can't even access many memories. Kelly suggested that maybe this is God's way of protecting me right now, and I agree. I haven't shared this with many because I don't like to talk about myself. I'm not a complainer and I don't want sympathy, but we've had a lot of losses since the kids. First, we lost Kevin's grandmother. Then Madison and Tanner's beloved dog died. We felt another connection with them was severed. So we got Kevin a lab puppy that got run over. After that, we got a bulldog puppy for me that was my companion for nine months until it was diagnosed with a fatal genetic disease and died. We lost my aunt, then my uncle. After that, we lost my mammal, and most recently, my grandpa. My remaining grandpa is battling cancer right now. And as of yesterday, my father, I spoke to him yesterday morning, and now he is lying unconscious in a hospital in Costa Rica. So please send up some prayers for him. January is an especially hard month for us. The first week in January was what would have been our daughter's 22nd birthday, and last week was the anniversary of their death. It's been four years. I may sound like I've got it together somewhat now, but I guarantee I couldn't have stood up here until just recently. This is not an easy path. I'm here to share my brokenness with you. I'm here to tell you that I'm real and I don't have it all figured out. I'm not fine or healed. This is a daily struggle for me to choose joy. I don't always deal with my grief in healthy ways. I've used food for comfort, alcohol to numb the pain. I've tried to avoid my reality by self-medicating, but these only offer a temporary reprieve or none at all. Grief is debilitating, it hurts. It takes away your sense of control, it causes you to be fearful, it makes you question everything you believe in, and it shakes your faith to the core. I'm standing up here today sharing my suffering, not for your sympathy, but to give you a message about how God has worked in my life and how we are getting through this day by day. I wanna start off by saying that we have the most amazing group of friends 
family, and community. Seriously, I know that we have had an easier time than other bereaved parents because of the tremendous support we've received, and a lot of it from so many of you in here. I hear about parents who have people tell them they should be over it by now. I see posts on child loss group pages, how no one will talk about their children, no one mentions their name. That would be like losing them all over again, and I can't imagine. If you've ever worried about mentioning a deceased child's name to the parent, don't be. You're not reminding us they died. We think about that every day. What you are doing, though, is acknowledging that they lived and they are remembered, and that is the most precious gift you can give us. Our tribe reaches out and checks on us. They invite us to events for families, even though we don't have children anymore. They show up on hard dates. They make sure our children's names are remembered and acknowledged at school events. At family get-togethers, they've put up a table with their pictures. Their friends also reach out to us, which is amazing. Tanner was 11, and now his friends are sophomores in high school, and they let us be a part of their lives. Madison's friends are getting married, having babies, graduating from college, and they invite us to be a part of that, too. Quick drink. The first thing that had a real impact on my thinking came in a newsletter from the While We're Waiting Ministry for Bereaved Parents, written by Jill Sullivan. I had questioned over and over, why hadn't God saved my children? The newsletter referred to a story in the Bible in Daniel 3. It was a Bible study I knew from my childhood, but I had never seen it in this way. Here's the story. King Nebuchadnezzar made a giant gold statue of himself and declared that when people heard the signal, they must bow to the ground to worship his statue. Anyone who refused to obey would immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. The king received word that there were three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to the, before the statue. When brought to the king, he questioned the men. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue that I've set up? I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. And then what god will be able to rescue from my power? The men replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, we will never serve your gods or worship your gold statue. Jill writes, I've always thought of these three guys as biblical heroes because they refused to bow down to an idol, even under threat of death. And while that was heroic, I've come to realize that the real heroism is reflected in the statement, but even if he does not. On the surface, it may look like they were giving God an escape clause, something to protect his reputation in case they burned up in the furnace, but I don't think so. They didn't pretend to know what God would do, nor did they try to tell him what to do. I think they trusted him to the point that they knew whatever he would do was right, even if it resulted in their death. God was God, however he chose to act. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all either prayed for our children's healing from physical or mental illness, or maybe from drug addiction, or for their safety and protection, or even just for their healthy birth. And we've had to face the even if he does not dilemma. And the choice we have to make is what we're going to do if he does not. If we're going to move forwards towards healing, we must choose to we must choose to trust him. So do you remember how the story of these three guys ends? Here it is from Daniel 3, 19 through 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the flaming furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were found and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, 
Were there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So the men came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Did you hear that? There were four men in that furnace. Those three guys got thrown into the furnace, but they were not in there alone. Just like those of us who have lost children, we've been thrown into a furnace, and sometimes it seems like it just keeps getting on hotter, just keeps getting hotter. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God will not let the fire destroy us. He will bring us through this fire, walking beside us in the flames. Isn't that beautiful? It was a beacon of light for me. And I've since told Jill when I met her how much that interpretation had helped me in my grief. I shared it with Kevin and, and some of my family as well. Thank you for your patience with that. Uh, trials draw us closer to the Lord. And there are many stories in the Bible to illustrate this. The Lord uses our trials so that we will cling to him. If your life was problem-free, why would you ever need to fully trust God? You'd have no problem trusting solely in yourself. I thought that my life was under control. When our life took this sudden and tragic turn and we realized we really were not in control, we clung to the one who was. Think of it. You're suddenly without your children and would give anything to see them again. Initially, I think that what might be what drew Kevin to want to know more about the Lord was the fact that if I'm a Christian, then I get to go to heaven and see them again. This isn't the end. Death is not the end. That is the hope we have in the Lord. Kevin and I clung to the Lord and to each other. I know that many marriages do not survive child loss. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we would not let him destroy our marriage. I am so thankful for my husband who is watching. I love you, Kevin. <laughs> We've been married for 22 years, and I love him more every day. We talked about what our future looked like without them and made a pact of sorts in the beginning. We knew how miserable that we were going to be, but we decided that we both couldn't fall apart at the same time because we'd be even more miserable. So when one of us is weak, the other is strong. Do you know in the weeks and now years to come, we've never said a single harsh thing to each other. No accusations or blame. No, you should have done this or only if you had done this. The thought of hurting the only other person in the world who could understand this pain and who loved our children and missed them as we did was unimaginable. We couldn't imagine not having each other to think. We could not imagine not having each other to cling to. I want you to know that my husband, Kevin, accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior and was baptized. Yes, yes. On a beautiful, sunny day on June 8th, 2017, on what, would, on what would have been our son Tanner's 12th birthday, surrounded by family and friends, he was baptized in the Brazos River, where we all grew up and loved to fish, by his brother Brian, who was a believer, an unexpected blessing on our journey of child loss. Our kids were amazing, and if you knew them, you would agree. These are my children. They're amazing. They were both so empathetic. They fought for the underdog. They couldn't stand to see others mistreated. Madison was a wise old soul often sought out for advice by her peers. She was smart and funny and loved to say and do offhand things to make people laugh, shock them. She would burst out in spontaneous song or dance. She loved to surprise her friends with thoughtful gestures. Tanner was my quiet, 
sensitive, sweet boy. Always a gentleman. He said, yes, ma'am, and no, sir. Even though this was not something we, we, we required, he just started doing it on his own. <laughs> he opened doors at school and held them until everyone else had walked in. He would include others in, sp in sports at recess that were being left out. He never in his life got in trouble because it hurt his feelings too much to disappoint anyone. So he never even got in trouble. I mean, he was such a sweet boy. I couldn't have asked for better children. He loved his family with a passion. He did. You know, the medical examiner's office called me the day after the wreck. They told me, your daughter chose to be a donor on her driver's license, so we don't need your permission. But would you give permission for your son to be a cornea donor? I knew Madison and I had talked about doing that due to my work in the emergency room and the stories I would tell her, but I didn't remember that she had put it on her license. I was so proud. We also agreed for Tanner to become a cornea donor. We knew, we'd have, we knew he would have chosen to give away those things he no longer needed. Every bereaved child wants their, every bereaved child, every bereaved parent wants their child to be remembered. I think that seeking purpose and meaning in our children's deaths and doing something good from that becomes part of our children's impact on the world. I thought how better to have people remember them than to perpetuate their legacy of kindness. We started a movement called Spread Kindness for MNT. We had bracelets made, these turquoise ones, and I know so many of you in here have them as well. There's a hashtag on it that says Spread Kindness for MNT. And it was to encourage others to perform purposeful acts of kindness in their honor and to post on social media. We hoped the idea would spread, and it did, like wildfire. Thanks to this community, our friends and family, and now even strangers, we've seen acts of kindness all over this county, state, country, and even the world. I think we have some pictures, and I thought it would blow up more so I can just tell you some of them. We have New York, the Coliseum in Rome, in Saipan, helping after hurricanes, a medical missions tour in Nicaragua, Mount Rushmore, Houston, um, a family had a, um, uh, military recruits that they um, housed and fed for Thanksgiving, and they were all given a bracelet and told the story of Madison and Tanner. Uh, we have Belize, Easter Island, Bahamas, Bryan and College Station, Texas, Iola, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, Austin, Mozambique, where they actually harvested an animal that fed the entire village, and they had put on there that they knew Tanner would, would have approved of that, and he would. <laughs> There's Australia, all over Atascosa County, Nashville, Tennessee, the Area 10 Officers Leadership Camp for FFA, um, Ethiopia, Dawa, Ethiopia, Florida, there's more up there, Niagara Falls. Anyway, those are just some of them, just some of the places. So that's an amazing thing to see, to know that kind things are being done in honor of your children. So... That helps our hearts a lot. I've also found when I'm feeling really low, it helps to do something for others and take the focus off myself and my grief. I listen to Christian music now. I didn't used to, but when we lost the kids, it was the only station I could listen to that didn't remind me of them. I found that I really liked it, and so many of the songs I heard were applicable to my situation, hurting people, crying out to the Lord. I heard a song with a different twist on a classic song that I've sung at church my whole life. It is well with my soul. I've always loved this song. One of the first times we were in church, after losing the kids, we stood to sing it. I couldn't do it. I thought, it's a lie. How could I possibly say that it is well with my soul ever again? I stood there with tears running down my face, and I refused to sing it. After that, it seemed that many places we went either had a shirt or a sign that said, it is well with my soul. And I've put, well, he will put um, the words to the song up there in case you don't know them. I'm, I wasn't going to read it all, but I just figured if you did not know the words to the song. Um, but I had vaguely remembered hearing the origin of the song many years ago, and I looked it up. It was written in 1873 by a man named Horatio Spafford. 
Mr. Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago. He and his wife had one son and four daughters. In 1871, they lost their four-year-old son to scarlet fever, and a few months after that, their home and belongings were destroyed by a fire. In 1873, tragedy struck again. The Spaffords had planned to visit Europe as a family, but business had kept Mr. Spafford behind. On the voyage, the ship they were traveling in was hit by another vessel, and all four daughters died. Horatio received a telegram from his wife many days later, saying only, saved alone. On his own voyage to meet his wife, the ship neared the place where his daughters drowned, and he was inspired to write the lyrics to this song. This man had known tragedy. He lost all his children. Could he really say those words? Was the loss of his children truly well with his soul? I don't think that's what he was saying. It took me a few years of soul searching and scripture reading of my own, but I think what Spafford was saying was that no matter what sorrows may come in this life, we trust in the one who gives us eternal life. Trusting in God is trusting him when things don't make sense. Knowing that his plan is always for your good. Knowing that he will reveal all things in time, even if that means in eternity. So now when the song starts at church, I still cry, but I'm also able to sing through my tears. And it's not a lie. It's my truth, however ugly and messy and beautiful it may be. And now I don't cry when I say it is well with my soul. I cry when I picture that last verse that says, O oh Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Take me home. <laughs> I just added that as the last verse, but <laughs> the last line was my own. But now the anticipation of joining Jesus and my children in heaven is what brings the tears. Sorry. I was blessed to have the ability to take time off after we lost the kids. At the hospital where I worked, so many of my coworkers donated their time off as well so that I could continue to stay home but remain employed and with a paycheck. After being off for six months, I had to make a decision. At that time, I didn't think that I could return to the emergency department or even nursing, so I resigned my position. So now I was no longer a mother, no longer working as a nurse. What was I? What was the purpose of my life? If I wasn't those things I had identified myself as for the past 18 years, I prayed that the Lord would guide me in the direction that I was supposed to go, because I didn't know what it was. While I was waiting for divine intervention and trying to figure out my next steps, I stayed busy. And this is, was a hard paragraph for me to write, because I don't like talking about myself, and this is all about me. <laughs> so, this is what I did. Uh, Kevin and I were blessed to be able to travel. We took spread kindness for M&T to Chile, Easter Island, Jamaica, and Belize. Kevin and I also took some classes on flipping houses. I enrolled and attended Texas Coffee School in Arlington. Yes, it's a thing. I attended food shows, home renovation events, took small business classes from the Small Business Development Center and from Launch, a nonprofit in San Antonio. We purchased, renovated, and flipped a house. We purchased some FEMA travel trailers at an auction, then fixed them up and sold them. I started and obtained a nonprofit status for Spread Kindness for M&T. I finished up my last year as a board member of Jordanton Youth Football League. I accepted a position as spring concessions director with the Jordanton Athletic Booster Club and worked concessions every weekend for the school in spring. Mm -hmm. With the help of friends, we raised money for four local charities through a shooting event celebrating Tanner called 4x4 Aim for Kindness. Other friends put on a powerlifting event honoring Madison where money was raised for scholarships. We assisted the Jordanton Police Department in purchasing toys for local children and wrapping them for their Blue Santa initiative. I was a participating member of the Chamber of Commerce. I participated as a founding board member for the Jordanton Education Foundation. I began attending a women's Bible study here at Cowboy Fellowship. I did continuing hours for nursing. I painted ladies' nails at a local retirement home. <laughs> we hosted Madison's friends for dinners and took Tanner's friends to the deer lease. I could keep going on, but the point is, I stayed busy. I continued to pray to the Lord. 
that he would send me in the direction that I should go. What was my purpose? Why am I still here? I also read a lot of books about child loss and grief. Most of those were not very helpful. The book that did resonate with me is called Option B by Sheryl Sandberg. After the tragic death of her husband, she thought she would never experience joy again. The book combines her personal insights with research on resilience and finding strength in the face of adversity. When option A for your life is unavailable, how will you make the most out of option B? That resonated with me. We were definitely not living our option A. What would we do with option B? The book gave me the psychology that my scientific mind needed to know while also supporting what my heart knew from the Lord. Their psychology studies said that traumatic experiences can lead to deeper faith, and people with strong religious and personal beliefs show greater resilience and post-traumatic growth. Not post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic growth. I continued to search the Bible for the questions I'd been asking the Lord and found some answers. I did have them put it on a slide up there. If, if you hear some you like, I want to screenshot it. But my first question was, why did my children die? And I actually don't have the answer for this. Um, I do know, though, that we won't know this side of heaven. So I have to be satisfied with that and trust in the Lord. I do know my children are in heaven. And his plan for their lives was fulfilled in the number of days he gave them. Psalms 139 says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Can we survive this? The Lord will not allow my circumstances to destroy me. 2 Corinthians 4 says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Will I ever stop crying? At least I know that my tears will not be wasted. Psalms 56, 8 says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. I know that my pain has a purpose. In James 1, 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, finish its work, so that you may be mature and, com and complete, not lacking anything. I know that I will not suffer forever. 2 Corinthians 4 states, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And this is one of my favorite right here. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little time, for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. I know that he gives me peace. Philippians 4, 7 and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I know that he gives me hope. Romans 15, 13. I pray, to God, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 29, 11 says... For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Great, great verses. A few months into our journey, I received that Facebook message that Rebecca read to you when she introduced me. It began with, hey there, I was watching you today at church. 
I didn't know Rebecca at the time. Many people, including strangers, had reached out to us in the months following their accident. It was a realization for me. I remember talking to Kevin that day and saying, people are watching us. That sounds kind of creepy, right? <laughs> people are watching us. We have a choice here. Are we going to forever be known as the couple that lost their kids? Probably. But are others going to see us as the couple who lost their kids and their, and their lives fell apart and were never the same, or as the couple that lost their children and then honored them in the Lord by fulfilling our purpose? For someone who needs answers and wants to have a purpose and identity, it resonated with me. It gave me a sense of responsibility and a direction. I wouldn't apologize for my tears. I would let others see my pain. I would be real with my pain, even if it made others uncomfortable. I'm not strong enough to do this on my own, and I'm only able to walk this journey of child loss by fully relying on the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, Paul is telling of asking the Lord to remove a burden from his life. He says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, still talking, says, So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I definitely don't delight in my weaknesses and hardships, but I may not know all the scriptures to use or to quote from memory. I may not have the right words or beautiful prayers like others do but I can show others my story and my suffering so that they can see God's strength. If you've never heard of Joni Erickson Tata, she's a Christian author who became quadriplegic at age 17 and is no stranger to suffering. She states, you were made for one purpose, and that is to make God real to those around you. Is this my purpose? Maybe I don't need all the pretty words. Maybe I just have to show up, to get up out of bed, to show that I get through each day by leaning on the Lord and trusting him with my pain. And maybe by doing this, the reality of God's power, his love, and his character will be made more real to a watching world. But besides getting up and going through my day, what else was I going to do? Still trying to find my purpose. <clears throat> My daughter Madison and I always loved going to coffee shops together. It was our thing. Tanner usually came too, but not for the coffee. When we moved to Jordanton in 2013, we loved our little town, but were sad that there were no coffee shops. We always used to joke about how we were going to open our own coffee shop here. I already mentioned that after losing the kids, I went to coffee school. I wanted to be prepared for whatever, the direc for whatever direction it was that I was supposed to go. While doing all those other things I mentioned, I also began working on how I might open a coffee shop. I found several potential locations, but with each one, something come up, came up that made the choice unwise. I told my friends and family that maybe this was not the direction I was supposed to go. I decided to shelve those plans for the time being and continued to pray for guidance. Kevin and I attended an informational meeting on foster care adoption, but decided we were in no way ready for all that entailed. One day I received a text from my friend Kelly, who I had met in Bible study here, saying that she had an idea of how my coffee shop and her business might work well together. We met up the next day, and she told me of her desire to help people through health and wellness. I liked the idea, but I didn't think I wanted a partner. I like to be in control. After all, this was my dream, and I'd already done so much work on it. But I really liked and respected Kelly and thought it couldn't hurt to explore that. I told her about the places that already tried to make work, and she suggested we look at one on the highway. I'd never bothered looking at it before because I knew that I could not afford that place based on my business plan and projections. We walked in and our realtor laughed. The place looked awful. Its last use was as a taxidermy shop, and even that had been years ago. It had only been used for storage since then. To anyone else in the world, they probably would have seen what we saw and said, no way. Kelly and I looked at each other and said, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I 
After countless hours of researching, negotiating, and praying on this location, we put our resources together and signed the contract for the building. It would have the coffee shop on one side and the health and wellness center on the other. Now, I don't think there's anyone else in the world that I could have become business partners with. We were told by many, don't go into business with a friend. It will ruin your friendship. Lots of people told us that. We're complete opposites. I'm detail-oriented, and I like things structured. I want to make a plan and only take conservative risks. Kelly is more laid back, less worried about the details. She tends to believe things will work themselves out, where I want to have a plan for how they will work out. <laughs> she laughs at me and gets me to laugh at myself when I'm being ridiculously uptight and bossy. We do have the most important things in common, though. We love people, we love the Lord, and we love each other. In the end, that's what matters and has brought us through everything. I feel so blessed to have her in my life, and I'm glad to be standing up here getting to say these things because if she was with me, she would argue. <laughs> so Kelly, she has helped me see the world differently. Kelly sees the Lord in everything and has helped me to see him, his hand in things also. There were so many things stacked against us when we were trying to open our business, and even since then. I mean, a pandemic two months after we opened. <laughs> Throughout this journey, we prayed for guidance and that we were working according to God's plan. Every time we came up against an obstacle, it worked itself out. That's how I might have seen it in the past, but the obstacles were no longer obstacles because we were working within his plan for us, and Kelly showed me that. It took six months of renovations to get our building to match our vision for it. We both knew the names we wanted for our shops. Mine was Sunshine House Coffee because I would always sing You're My Sunshine to the kids growing up. And they were the sunshine in our home. They're represented by the two coffee beans in the logo. Kelly had named her business Rise to Health and Wellness and we laughed because now we'd be Rise and Shine. <laughs> so that is our official sign right there over on Highway 97. Not only did I want Sunshine House Coffee to honor the memory of my children, but other children as well. No one wants to be in the bereaved parents club, but so many of the people we've met on this journey are the strongest and most compassionate people we know. I thought for months on how we could make a memorial for the children at our shop. I wanted it to be beautiful without it being sad and depressing. It took me over a year to finally figure it out, and this is what I came up with. It took several weeks to accomplish and is all handcrafted completely by us. We could not have done it without the help of friends and family. So, so many of them in here helped us. Uh, this beautiful work of art is also our memorial. Each circle that has a child's name on it also has a QR code that you can scan with your phone. The link will take you to a slideshow of pictures or a video of the child if their parents gave that to me. Some of the links are not currently working, so please let me know if anyone is technologically inclined and might be able to help us figure that out. <laughs> I'm sad to say, but we have more names to add to the wall, and so I want to make sure we fix, fix that glitch before we add those. Kelly and I like to call our combined min business our ministry. In fact, it says that in the employee handbook under our mission statement. We've been so blessed to have the team that we have who helps us in our mission of kindness and showing love to all who enter Sunshine House. I remember a conversation we had, and Kelly said, who knew our little team would become like our family? And I laughed, and I said, that's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> Some of my kids, which is what I call the baristas, are the same age as Tanner and Madison would be, and some were their friends. In fact, several of them are here tonight, as well as Crystal, our good friend and a retired teacher, that jumped in when we were overwhelmed the first few weeks and has stayed with us since. Bless her heart. Where are you guys? Where's my, where's my people? Ah! Love you guys. <laughs> since I've decided to give my testimony here, I prayed so much for the Lord to guide me in telling the parts of the story that I should tell. I thought I would mainly talk about Sunshine House and our journey to make it a reality, but that's not what came out. That didn't seem to be the direction I needed to go. I asked the Holy Spirit to fill me with the words that I needed to share with you ladies. 
So the full story of Sunshine House will have to be for another time because it deserves the time to show all the ways that God helped make our dream a reality. I will say, though, that today is our one-year anniversary of being open, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate. <laughs> so, have I found my purpose, my new identity? I'm still a nurse, a wife, a friend, a mother of angels, but now I am also a barista, <laughs> a daughter of the King of Kings, and a soon-to-be foster mom. Yes. Kevin and I just finished all our classes last Saturday in the process to become foster parents. So, does being a Christian and trusting in the Lord mean that this has been easy? In no way would I say that. I found the scriptures that comfort me, but that doesn't shield me from the pain of missing my children. What it does do, though, is give me a reprieve. I didn't see it at first. I didn't understand how I could function through this pain. What does it mean that the Lord comforts us? What does it mean that he's close to the brokenhearted? The more I'm learning and the more I have a relationship with the Lord, it's becoming clearer to me. I'm still heartbroken about my children and always will be. Something reminds me of them, be it a song or a smell, the weather of a cold, gray, misty, dreary day like it was the day of their accident. Instead of allowing the waves of grief to drag me under, I take a minute, I cry, I remember them, and then I stop and go on about my day. I can't explain it. It's not my doing. That is how the Lord comforts me and gives me peace and a hope. The hope of salvation and a future with him and our children in heaven. So let me close it up here. Waiting for the band that's coming up here soon. <laughs> so, if you find that you are tired of trying to do things by your own strength, that you need the Lord to carry your burdens, that you want the comfort of the Lord in your life, the peace that only He can provide, the joy that comes from knowing Him, then pray that prayer to Him tonight. If you'd like for someone to pray with you about this or listen to your story or share your tears, we have so many Christian ladies here tonight that can do this with you, and that will be up here in a bit. You are not alone. If you've never given your life to the Lord and want to do that, we can all bow our heads together and you can say this prayer with me. Dear Lord, it's me. I am hurting and I am tired. Tired from trying to do everything in my own strength. Sometimes I don't feel like I can do this on my own. Lord, remind me that I don't have to do this on my own, that I can't do this on my own, that your power is made perfect in my weakness. Today I give up carrying the weight of all that's too much for me. Lord, I want to know more of you and more about the peace that only you can give. I believe that Jesus is your son and he died on the cross for our sins. Please come into my heart, Lord. I need you. I trust your love for me. I trust your plans for me. And I trust you will use all of this for good. In your loving name I pray. Amen.